the poet Billy Collins wrote these words called On Turning Ten. The whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down with something, something worse than any stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light, a kind of measles of the spirit, a mumps of the psyche, a disfiguring chicken pox of the soul. You tell me it is too early to be looking back, but that is because you have forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one and the beautiful complexity introduced by two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier at nine a prince. But now I am mostly at the window watching the late afternoon light. Back then it never fell so solemnly against the side of my treehouse, and my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today, all the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself, as I walk through the universe in my sneakers. It is time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends, time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I could shine. But now when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. As we move into a month of examining how we become a people of imagination, this image of it seems only yesterday I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light is one that deeply resonates. Billy Collins's poem talks about losing our imagination at the age of 10 when we turn that first big number and that this is the beginning of sadness. I don't know if we begin to lose it at 10 or 20 or 50, but somewhere along the way, it does feel as if the ability to imagine drains from us somehow, and we lose a great deal when it is gone. Our imaginations form our lives, our symbols, the way we structure and organize our world. It is absolutely critical to the quality of our lives. Think about how it feels when you imagine something new, some new dreaming that allows you to leave the routine everyday existence by fantasizing about things that make life interesting. Travel, theater, libraries, time with friends, time in nature. Imagination gives us the chance to step outside of ourselves and all of our believed limitations, to dream, to create something new, to believe something is possible. It can be seen as the birthplace of our hopes, the thing that fires our creativity, relieves our boredom, alleviates pain, enriches our relationships, those with others, and with our very own selves. I know that since March, I have been doing a lot of imagining, creating in my mind a different life than the one we are living now. And I know I am not alone in this. This past summer, the psychologist Kathy Melchiotti wrote, I just got a boarding pass to go on a mission to Mars. I am not kidding. You, too, can get one by visiting the NASA website and submitting a request. The flight is scheduled to leave in 2026, and because of my age and the fact that I am not the equivalent of astronaut John Glenn, only my boarding pass will be on the flight. But after months of being grounded from travel and flying due to the pandemic, I desperately need an adventure, even if only one in my mind. Imagining what the future will bring 
post-pandemic is daunting for most of us. Our brains are wired to choose negative scenarios over positive ones. Malchiotti shared, I know that my worst days so far have been those on which I cannot visualize anything other than my current narrative. Unending physical distancing, donning a mask to go pick up groceries, staring at the computer screen for yet another meeting. But in order to get through this marathon, we now must begin to see beyond it, remembering what it was like to pretend when we were children, calling deeply on the power of our imagination. At four, I was an Arabian wizard. I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. Can you remember who you believed yourself to be at those early ages? I know at some point, I was an archeologist, at another, an astronaut, and at some point, I was an ambassador at the United Nations. Who were you when you could pretend that anything was possible? If there ever was a time when we could use the power of imagination, it's now. Arundhati Roy wrote an article entitled, The Pandemic is a Portal. And in it, he said, whatever it is, this virus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink this world we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse, he says, than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. And this one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our poisoned rivers, and our smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Here we are at the beginning of a new year, having made it through a year that brought so much into clearer focus, both hatred and brutality, and also moments of great love and connection. What is it that we can imagine for this year to come? Who do we want to be? What do we want our families, our communities, our world to look like when we are on the other side of this? Can we break with the past and imagine our world anew? There was a recent interview with the author, Jason Reynolds, and he talked about the use of imagination in his work. He said, I think that my role will always be to figure out how to create fortitude in the minds and the bodies and the spirits of young people. I'm trying to fortify them. It's the reason why I do so much around imagination, because at the end of the day, ultimately, we need young people to be able to activate their imaginations. If they cannot, we are in trouble big time. But how does one keep an imagination fresh in a world that works double time to suck it away? How does one keep an imagination firing off when we live in a nation that is constantly vacuuming it from us? He says, I think the answer is one must live a curious life. One must have stacks and stacks and stacks of books on the inside of their bodies. And those books don't have to be the things you've read, that's good too, but those books could be the conversations you've had with your friends that are unlike the conversations you were having last week. 
It could be about this time, taking the long way home and seeing what's around you that you've never seen because most of us stay in our little quadrants. We stay in a five block radius. But what if you were to walk the other way? What if you were to explore the places around you? What if you were to speak to your neighbor and figure out how to strike up a conversation with a person you've never met? What if you were to walk into a situation free of preconceived notion just once? Once a day, walk in and say, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's see. I'm going to give that person the benefit of the doubt to be a human. Reynolds tells us, step out of your neighborhood. Talk to somebody different because we underestimate what this does for the mind. We underestimate what it does for the imagination. And as long as these imaginations are firing off, as new stories are being written, as new dreams are being shared, then we have hope for a different and better future. And here's the critical piece of this for me, and it comes back to our story of Henri Matisse and the iridescence of birds. The artists, the poets, this is what they do. They ask us to wake up, to listen to our dreams, to imagine, to pay attention, to consider, and to think. If we are going to be brave enough to step into our imaginations, to think about building a new world together, to create stacks of books inside ourselves built on conversations with those we know and those we don't, I believe we need to begin to see one another with an artist's vision with new eyes, with a way of seeing that when we look at one another, we see iridescence, we see beauty, we see a story waiting to unfold in front of us, we see brilliance, we see possibility. What if we saw ourselves in this way? And what would it be like if we believed everyone we met had nothing under their skin but light. And the greatest world we could imagine was actually possible if we could all help one another shine. As we do this work together, there are pitfalls. It is easy for us to get caught in the dominant cultural influences that tell us that our issue, our dream, our vision is the correct one, the most important one, the one that all should heed and follow. We cling to what we know as right and good, and we stop seeing one another as beings of light. And we begin to see one another as competitors for scarce resources. This serves no one's well-being. If we are going to live into our dreams, we need all of us. We need the visions, the hope, the dreams, the tears, the frustration, the passion of every single one of us. In a time of deep division in our world, our imaginations must be grounded in a clearer vision, an artist's vision that can see iridescence and grounded in a deep compassion, an active compassion that is seen as an intentional daily practice, cultivated courageously, patiently, deeply with one another. This can be the life we share, allowing us to risk seeing ourselves and one another with that artist's vision, to be curious, 
to fire our imaginations, to share our dreams, to bravely write new stories of possibility and hope, to give one another the benefit of the doubt, to believe in one another, to believe in ourselves, to be humans, to be humans made of light together. So I'll leave you this morning in the beginning of this long awaited new year with these words from the Reverend Teresa Soto. The world makes many demands on your time, your skin, your heart, until you are left gasping and wondering if you will ever do enough, have enough, be enough. Stop your counting measuring and checking. You are enough. So much more than enough. Made from fragments of the galaxy. You do measure up. And to recover from the doubt pressed upon you, the antidote for doubt is dreaming. All the dreams that call to you, lime green and frosting pink dreams, the other soft and tender dreams that run blue to gray, sky indistinguishable from lulling sea. The dreams that seem impossible. Listen, that's their nature. If they had already happened, then they would be reality, solid and smooth like the round bone home of an unbroken egg. Be brave enough to name your dream. Nurture it and allow the rhythm of your breath and the power of your imagination to bring your dreams to life. May we be brave enough to make it so.